thank you very much, and it's uh, wonderful. It's always wonderful to be in Stockholm uh, with uh, with my good friends from the Internet Society in Sweden, um, and to also to see so many of you in this room. Perhaps I could just ask our panel uh, to 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 join me up on stage. We have a really fantastic panel uh, for you today. We have um, Amelia Anders Dotter, who is MEP for the Pirate Party, um, and of course a Swedish national. We have um, we have David Mutanda, who is Nordic Policy Council of Google, right? Yes. That's right. And we have Robin Wilton, a privacy specialist for the Internet Society. Um, as was mentioned, we had another panelist, uh, Patrick Wallström, uh, who's the CEO of OpenDNSSEC and, uh, and uh, uh, an employee of uh, .se. Unfortunately, he's unable to be with us today because he's um, ill. I think it's also worth mentioning that the organisers, and particularly Stefan Jonsson, who's worked tirelessly to prepare this session, made great efforts to reach out to the security forces, both from the United Kingdom, from Sweden, and all of them declined to participate. I just wanted to make that clear. So although we have, you know, t the ideal balanced pal panel would have somebody from, from that perspective as well, but we'll do our best. Um, the format of today's session, there's an awful lot to talk about, and we have a hard stop at half past 11 to, to make space for the next session. So, um, I'm, I hope that we will get as much audience participation as possible. We're going to dispense with sort of the, the standard opening statements and just just move to the um, to the questions. I think that the the issues that we'd focus on from the Snowden revelations are the um, the Prism allegations, the secret orders under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, alleged collusion of internet companies, if I can put it neutrally in that way, um, uh, and, and that orders not restricted to those suspected of crimes. Um, tempora, wiretapping direct into fibre optic cables with the active assistance, it is alleged, of the UK GCHQ and also of the Swedish FRA. I didn't think we'd lose our Google panellists so quickly, but <laughs> <laughs> you're back. Uh, oh, thank you. And uh, other allegations include deliberate weakening of encryption protocols, back doors being built into software, cyber attacks on allies, and, and a whole sense that there are more revelations to come. So that's just sort of ground setting. And I think, of course, um, the, the, the thing that seems to have lodged in the public consciousness is the idea that Angela Merkel's phone has been tapped, and why? Can I just have a show of hands before we start? How many people in this room feel that these allegations are credible? Anybody think that they are not credible? Okay, thank you. Amelia, when the... Um, sorry, d would you like to <laughs> finish your drink? But when the British Secret Services were questioned by a parliamentary committee, they were quite angry about these revelations and said they're giving our enemies a massive boost, you know, our enemies are rubbing their hands with glee. Do you think that it's wrong that these things have been made public? Um, no. Do you think that it's... Um, so they, they would say, look, we need secret services and we need secrets in order to have the kind of quiet, ordered life that, that people in Sweden enjoy, that people in the UK enjoy. Why can't they have their secrets? So I think the more powerful you are, the more transparent you need to be. And so the problem with these institutions is that they're incredibly powerful, they're incredibly close to the government, they have direct access to the prime ministers of their countries at any given time, they have an extreme information overtake over everyone else in society. They are presently the only institutions in European member states tasked with intellectual leadership for these European um, nations. And they need to be more transparent simply because they wield a lot of power and influence over what everybody else does. But um, if I ask David, so can you, in the interest of transparency, can you tell us everything about you've, what Google has been asked to do uh, by the American Secret Service? Can we have a bit of transparency? Well, we have asked for being allowed to tell you about that. We've asked the secret court, who is in charge of the secret law, to reveal us of our of duty of secrecy so we can tell you. And as far as I know, we haven't got an answer from the secret court yet. 
Okay. But, but nations do need secrets, don't they, Robin? I mean, if, if we can all just tell everybody about what sort of investigations are going on, doesn't that compromise security? I, I think I'd certainly agree that nations need secrets. And um, I personally, so I, I grew up as the child of a, of a diplomat. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of graduated scale, isn't there, between um, open political activity, diplomatic activity, some of which happens discreetly, and then intelligence gathering. Um, but as Amelia said, the secret intelligence gathering is extremely an extremely powerful tool. And that certainly doesn't absolve it from the need to be transparent and accountable. Um, I think if you've looked at any of the legal instruments that govern things like privacy and data protection, you'll see that they have exemptions in for things like national security and law enforcement. Having sat in on the drafting sessions for some of those documents, you cannot sit in those sessions and say, I don't think those exemptions should be in there. It's just not credible. Um, and and if, you, if you try that, you're sort of marking yourself out as some kind of anarchist. Um, so, but having said that, if you allow those exemptions to be included in these laws and regulations, there must be some kind of governance regime that prevents their abuse. And transparency and accountability are the best form of governance to prevent abuse of those powers. Mm. I think Amelia Anders' daughter right. wanted uh, to come in on Because that. we have the restrictions. There is this law proposal in the European Union to protect the privacy of all of the European citizens in a better way than we previously accomplished. It's well investigated. It was 17 years before somebody had the guts to make this proposal. And the restrictions section to my best of knowledge, um, lists public order, not national security. In the leaks from the Council of Ministers, we have national security and defense, because these apparently are very different things. Um, but in the Commission proposal and in the proposal adopted by the Parliament, I think we didn't actually put in national security as a general exception. It's even, I was thinking about this in, in technical standardization regulations of the European Union, that um, radio equipment we know is often custom made to uh, allow law enforcement to easily wiretap um, technologies, but actually in the European legislation it says that you can only do that in so far as the radio equipment is solely used for national security purposes. Solely used is the exception provided for in European law Everything else is an implementation issue. We have an extreme problem with enforcement of our existing laws, and especially in the European Union. We have a lot of good law already. We're, we're just not ensuring that they're applied. Mm -hmm. It's partially a member state problem, it's partially a commission problem, and partially a technical company problem, because actually large technical companies from the United States aren't very helpful in ensuring that European values of transparency and privacy are incorporated into the technical frameworks that we're using for our daily communications. David, do you want to respond to that accusation? Um, may I respond to something which my panelist on the left said first? Of course. Um, because. We're talking about transparency as a mean of preventing abuse, but I think transparency has a, a greater meaning than that because at the end of the day, we're talking about government's exercise of power, and that power has to be judged to be proportional. That's a sort of a, a basic foundation in society. And the only way we can judge if that exercise of power, be that to protect the nation or, or police or whatever, is proportional if we can balance, is if we can balance this against different. So we need to know what kind of measures governments are taking in order to be able to judge whether or not this is proportionate against the aims. And that basic discussion of proportionality is, I think, absolutely necessary now in order to bring back uh, the key word trust into the whole matter. Now, I guess you're going to talk about this later, whether or not people have lost trust in the internet. Mm. I don't think that has happened yet, but we see big institutions beginning to mistrust the internet, and that is dangerous for Europe. That's very dangerous for Europe. So I think. Uh Bringing it back to the issue of proportionality is very, very important. Yes, and I think that you, know, you do have these concepts that run through the tried and tested, that these aren't new, proportionality, necessity, as, as, the, as the things that have to be there if you're going to override individuals' rights to privacy. But I, I want to just take a little while to think about the legal oversight and the accountability that's been there um, up until now. But Amelia... 
you know, you talk about the European values, but actually it seems that the European Commission and the European institutions have been asleep at the switch. I mean, you had, uh, as Caspar Bowden mentioned last year, the Article 29 Working Group report on cloud computing completely misses the risk of FISA, doesn't it? And, you know, so have the European institutions been as effective as... The, they, they have the credibility. and We're supposed to have privacy laws. So what has the Parliament, what have the other e European institutions been doing? I guess after... So uh, the previous data protection regulation or um, legislation that we had in the European communities is from 1995. It was known to be a problem already back in 1998, and a reform process was underway at that time. But then happened 2001, and it would take almost um, 12 years or 11 years, I guess, till 2012 before somebody had the guts to bring up these proposals again, and that was Vivian Reading, the Commissioner for Human Rights. And so um, I think 2001 was a very kind of disruptive moment, mm -hmm. which is funny for me because I'm born in 1987, so I don't remember a lot of things before 2001. It's something that I'm discovering in retrospect, what a humongous change it was going from the optimism of the German reunification into this completely dystopian um, future where, where basically we resign all control over our law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So the European Union, it's a very naive institution because it doesn't have its own law enforcement and it doesn't have its own intelligence agency either. And it means that unlike in Sweden where you have the FRA sitting right below the, the prime minister feeding information and policy points all the time in the European community, we don't have that. So we don't have this, there's no institutional lobby that defends itself <coughs> in the EU. And that is um, one of the things that the European Union should be very grateful for and take better, better care of. Um, and that could, and also probably is the reason why the European legislation is essentially very friendly to human rights values, um, privacy protections, personal data, confidentiality of communications. Well, then you have the enforcement problem. But there's How a difference between being friendly and being effective. Right, so we lack sanctions. The previous data protection legislation we had basically had maximum fines of, of 20,000 euros or so, like really, really low maximum mm -hmm. fines. We proposed to raise them. But um, the member states are currently blocking further progress on the new data protection laws. Um, so uh, please write to your government and tell them not to cock this up. Um, and we have also the problem in technical standards that the European Commission never found a useful way of ensuring that technical standards are uh, made in a way that is conducive to the values that we want to have in, in the law uh, or that we have already enshrined in the law. So this is a, a big kind of problem. How do we ensure that there is effective implementation also in the technical level of the values that actually we want to preserve on, on the internet? And how can you help different technical standards, organizations around IT yeah. technologies and interface with the European communities in a useful yes, way? Yes, and I think I, I'd like to, to pick up on that in a, in a little while is the sort of what next, you know, I, I want to, uh, I think we need to, to all sort of acknowledge this this event that's happened that sort of seems to have changed things and to, to explore perhaps failures in accountability. I've got Robin and then David. Robin, can, could you just um, talk about parliamentary oversight in the UK? You know, how effective, do you, we've heard about it in the European institutions, how, and, and Amelia's points about uh, Sweden. What about the UK? Do you think there's effective oversight of um, GCHQ and others? Well, I think, um, so I have, I have to tread a, a line here in the sense that as an ISOC staff person, um, we, we try not to mix it with individual nation states' governments. <laughs> uh, we, we try to influence them through other fora. Having said that, um, as, a, as a citizen um, and going on what I see in the media, uh, which again, as Emily said, I think is entirely credible, uh, we, we had, you may have seen it, uh, the three heads of intelligence services um, go publicly before the parliamentary committee that is supposedly in charge of overseeing their activities. Normally they have those, those uh, sessions behind closed doors and we don't hear anything about it. Um, and a, a great deal was made out of the fact that this one was being done publicly and being televised in the name of greater openness and so on. But if you actually listen to the questioning, um, I mean I described it as softly throwing marshmallows at them. It was not 
I mean, the, the BBC website described it as a grilling, which I felt was somewhat optimistic. Um, I it think really the grill was not, set was low. Yeah, the grill was set to kind of warm gently. Um, so it, it, it wasn't a good example of effective oversight. Um, but apart from that, and, and also we found out afterwards that all the questions had been pre-vetted and it was basically a pretty much a scripted meeting. Um, so that's not effective governance. Um, effective governance means opening yourself up to challenge by people who do not share your goals, your objectives, um, your, 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 your perspective. Um, but So one other thing, I, apart from that meeting, uh, we also saw in the press a member of the... Um, Oh, goodness, I'm going to get the, uh, the, the National Security Committee, the NSC, um, in the UK, which is a sort of a, a, a fairly wide, um, but not very wide, committee of MPs. So less restricted than the kind of the super cleared guys who are allowed to go into those closed meetings. So a member of the National Security Committee, who is also, was also a cabinet minister, said that when he was in those posts, he was not told anything about... <laughs> Uh, tempora, the GCHQ mass interception program. Well, I find that extraordinary that such a major part of the intelligence policy should go without the awareness of someone in his position. Yeah. So I think there is an, a, an accountability so, gap. Yeah, yes. there's, there's accountability and failure to predict, really. I mean, this one of the things that I'd, I'd like to ask you, David Motanda of, of Google, is uh, you know, in April la this year, we have Frank LaRue, who I think probably. As you know, of course, as UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights is an enormously capable and deeply respected person, but he's probably got far less c technical capability and insight into really how things are going than Google has within its organisation. And when you read his report, it's like he has clairvoyance. He predicted all of these re revelations without actually naming the US and UK. So. What was Google doing? How come you guys didn't see this coming? And where were your whistleblowers? How do I respond to that? Well, I'd like you to. Uh, any ideas? <laughs> uh, we have continuously worked with security in our systems. I mean, this is, this is not the new first story where nations have alleged to try to break our systems. Uh, we have continuously worked with encryption. We have enforced encryption between our different system parts, etc., etc., etc. But as we can read the allegations in the press, um, I think my, my, my general counsel used the word, he's outraged to the extent that the US government seems to be willing to go. Mm. I, I don't know if that is a, a complete answer to your question, but mm -hmm. we are doing as good as we can, and we are yeah. evolving and developing along the road. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and also, I'd, I think it's worth acknowledging that Google has actually turned up today, unlike members of the security forces. So, you know, kudos to Can you Can I say for doing something that. here? Yes. Which you, you keep on asking yeah. questions, and I want to respond to Robert <laughs> and Amelia. <Sorry. laughs> I think there's a distinguishment to be made here, because Amelia talks about the data protection regulation of Europe, which is really a set of regulation which will regulate where characters like Google and Facebook will act. And that's one thing. And we are supposed to be characters who act within the law. Mm. The problem of, 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 of the Snowden revelations is that other characters turn up which seem to be acting above the law. And however well intended the data protection regulation is, it will not solve the revelations about NSA and, and the British counterparts. Mm. So that is a different problem. And we're talking about the trust of the internet. And in terms of the data protection agency, Amelia, as a representative of the parliament, and me as a representative of Google, actually have the same goal goal of restoring trust. Now, we may have differences in opinion about it, but we have yet not seen where, where do we have the NSA and where do we have the government surveillance? Because that's a different set of, and higher fees and how, how higher sanctions in the framework will not force the government agencies, agencies to stop reinforcing, uh, stop, stop surveilling. Oh, David, could just a housekeeping thing yes. into the and, mic. And I mean, one question I would like to ask Amelia is, we have something at Google which is called the Transparency Report, which is basically listing every year how many requests for information have we received from, from governments across the world. And, and the figures are staggering, and the figures are increasing. You can, look, you can Google it if you want to. Um, we have, on several occasions, asked governments, why do you not create a transparency report of yourself? 
be public with the number of requests that you and your agencies has put forward to get access to information. And we see little traction across Europe about this. And I mean, that would be something that I would very much want to see Brussels take the lead on, yeah. for an example. Thank you. Can we have any questions from the audience? Because I, I do yeah. want to... Can to I first respond to it? So, um, I, I don't wish for Google, which has sponsored like six organizations in Brussels to lobby me against data protection, to be standing here saying that I'm thinking that data protection regulation is the only solution to the problems with the NSA revelation, when it's very clear that that is not the case. Uh, but I think that it makes perfect sense that, for instance, the NSA or the FRA or the GCHQ don't like the data minimization principle. And so having that in the European law and having proper accountability for companies that don't follow the law, because the problem is you can't blame companies for uh, yielding to the NSA because they're backed by the violence monopoly of the government. We want for Google to follow the laws also when they concern law enforcement because it would be untenable if large companies suddenly started saying, let's not follow the law. But so what we do in Europe then by imposing sanctions on companies that, for instance, collaborate with the NSA in the US would be that we create the financial incentive for Google not to collaborate with the NSA, and so NSA would have to make it more expensive for you yeah. to, to not collaborate, or to, colla um, to not collaborate then, you know. And so th that is kind of the deal with that. But is that the transparency reports from governments? I have no problem with that. And I'm in fact very irritated that the European Commission has shown such a weak initiative on this important point, which is also perfectly in line with European tradition. I have no idea who's lobbying the Commission against these, uh, these measures. Um, but of course, we should be addressing that better in the next legislature, and I hope that the next Commission will do so. I'm going to go to the audience now, this question. Any other questions we can... Okay, I'll come to you next, if we can just get a mic there. And uh, then hi, my, my name is Björn Larsson, and uh, I had a question uh, regarding, uh, I read the report that you could see signs of big American tech giants starting to have lower business in growing markets because they are hurt by this Snowden revelation. So I think, do you think that this will help uh, legislators to consider reining in on these uh, surveillance issues, or how do you think it will affect the current debate that uh, business in certain markets is not going so good as it used to be? David Motanda, can you respond to that? Are you actually hurting in developing markets as a result of this? I think it's too early to say, with certainty. But I think... I think Europe needs to be very, very careful here because the, the solution of creating a European digital sovereignty is in fact creating trade barriers. And, and the open internet is a motor for growth and development. And we need to be very careful. I'm, I'm very concerned with what Amelia tells me, that Europe seems to be unable to solve its differences with the US and instead they go after the companies who try to oblige by both laws. The proper solution would be for Europe to address these issues on a, on a higher level and we could get an international framework for what is, acceptance, what is acceptable and not. And then we would all be able to abide by it. But the, the situation where she describes forcing international companies to contradict laws in other countries or receive punishment in Europe is it might be the worst of all solutions, or the best of all worst solutions we have right now, but it's not a sustainable solution if we want to use the momentum that the internet has as a platform for free trade and growth. Robin? So, sorry for a long answer. Robin Wilton? Sure. Uh, so David uh, mentioned fixing the problem at a high level there. And I think if you take this up to the high level, you come to something that Emily mentioned earlier, which is values. And there it seems to me there is currently a significant clash in values predominantly between, at the moment, the two sides of the Atlantic. Because if you look at the European approach to things like privacy, you find that it is based on principles, on human rights, on Article 8. Um, that is seen as a, as a right which sometimes overrides the compulsion for economic activity. Your human rights can be something that prevent a company from doing something which commercially it would like to do. I don't think that balance is the same on the other side of the Atlantic. So I think if you do raise the debate to the level of values, which is a good idea, 
that is one of the clashes that you have to resolve. What do you do when, in the States, there is no overarching right to privacy that is viewed as something that can sensibly override commercial prerogatives? Okay. It is much more common in the States to hear the view that economic activity, not just economic growth, but economic activity, actually trumps human rights or trumps the privacy imperative. And, and I think Thank at you. the values level, that's a clash that we have yet to resolve. Thank you. I've got another question here and then one at the back, so perhaps you could just line up some... some. I know, I, I sort of predicted that this would happen with this session, is that we all want to react to everything that everybody says and we also have to, to, to respect the time, so apologies to the panel and, and those in the audience who, who are unable to get everything that they want in. Sir? So, my name is Jakob de Lunda, I'm Program Director at the Swedish Think Tank Forest. And regarding transparency reporting, we have actually, during 2013, uh, been trying to make uh, our own transparency report of how uh, Swedish governments interact. How's that going? Uh, I'm actually quite shocked that so very few uh, Swedish authorities actually respond to us and, uh, and, uh, and disclose in what way they do, they do this. And uh, in Almedalen this summer, we had a seminar and, and we, uh, we disclosed uh, how poor this is going and how little authorities want to respond. But that uh, hasn't been enough. So now in the f coming uh, days and weeks, we will actually disclose our work on a public website where we will show um, how uh, the authorities actually act and how they do not want to respond uh, to us. Thank you. Uh, and the question at the well, back... While, while the microphone's going... Yes, while the microphone's um, moving. Don't, don't be too depressed, because in the States there's a body called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, the PCLOB, which was set up, what must be, what, three years ago, something like that? Um, and it has published a report in the last couple of days, if you, again, if you Google it, um, <laughs> you'll find that they, st they too are very disappointed with the response rate. Uh, at least three major relevant central government departments in the US haven't uh, responded at all. And they comment that some of the other departments that have replied have basically replied with useless data. Thank you. Um, I'm Henriette Esterhuis in APC. Actually, myself and other organizations wrote to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. We didn't get a response. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask um, um, you know, sort of two questions. The one is, is, is to address to Google and, and about the Google Transparency Report, which many of us in the internet community have had presentations on um, about how fabulous it is in the last five years. And it just seems quite ironic that, that while Google was promoting its transparency report as a best practice example of self-regulation in the interest of freedom and liberty, it was in fact not being transparent about some pretty fundamental stuff. And I, and I just wonder what that's done to Google as a company inside Google. Does everyone in Google, um, how did Google manage information about these complexities that it had to negotiate at all policy executives know about everything that was going on and, and not being disclosed and just you know what that has done for you as a, as a company and then my second question is actually I am um, I, I'm much happier with Europe setting a good case and managing to um, exert some pressure on companies to disclose we saw that with Microsoft and the antitrust um, legislation which was how long 15 20 years ago and it was pretty fundamental um, so I think it's quite risky to wait for a global agreement. I'd much uh, uh, rather see Europe do something substantial and set good precedent rather than wait for international um, negotiations where the security establishment will inevitably become part of it and, and I think probably dilute what comes out of it. Thank you. So what have these revelations done inside Google to your sense of don't be evil or is it see no evil? Hear no evil. You don't know, be evil. Don't be evil. It is don't be evil. It is don't be evil. If you look at the latest blog post uh, about the latest update of the, uh, the transparency report, you'll see that we have a blackened diagram, which is the number of FISA requests. Um, and we are not allowed, in a, we're an American company, and we're not allowed in accordance to American law to reveal these figures. That's a fact. Now, I think what, what you're asking is, should we place ourselves above the law and publish them anyway, or not? Um, now, that is a question you cannot ask me. I'm a mere foot soldier here in mm -hmm. Stockholm. You should go to California and ask the real bosses about that. 
But Ed I think Edward I think Snowden wasn't allowed to make the revelations that he made, was he? I'm sorry to push you on yeah, this, well, but no, I, no, no, I think that I'm it's... thinking about a life in Russia, but I... <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but probably... No, but, uh, you know, seriously, not to joke this away. Yes, yeah. I mean, then we run into the issue, what do, do a company have a sort of corporate social soul that we should live up to? Well, that's the whole basis of self-regulation, yes. isn't it? Is that you're supposed mm -hmm. to. And I, I mean, I, I would claim Google does, but apparently in this case, it has been decided not to reveal these figures yet. But I would also, I mean, going back to whether or not we can operate a digital sovereign Europe or not, the NSA has claimed to be intercepting cables by themselves or by others. And I don't think a rule about data location in Europe will stop NSA from mm. doing this. So the question is, will you, will you really address the problem, the real problem, by, 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 by creating walls around Europe? I'm not sure you will. I mean, I, th I think the key here is something they call MLAT. I'm sorry, I don't think that we're, we're proposing that. I think that what we're proposing is that you should, what I think we're proposing is that you shouldn't be handing over personal data from Europeans to foreign intelligence agencies and law enforcement without asking European Data Protection Authority first. And so this uh, fortress that you're describing, I think, is not there. You're perfectly happy, you're for perfectly welcome to transport my personal data to the US as long as you don't give it to the NSA. But Amelia, Anders daughter, to be fair on Google, if you've got, if you're sitting there as, a, as a, 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 an executive no, with, the, the, with these and you're asked, do I cooperate with the secret services or do I kind of maybe breach possibly some data protection law, what's going to be more painful for me in the short term? Right, so what I hear Google saying here is that they don't want to violate the NSA request and the FISA requests, which I respect, and I think that large companies should follow the law. I think that is relevant and adequate, but what he's saying is that he doesn't want to follow European law, and I don't think that's relevant and adequate. I think it's relevant and adequate that Google follows also European law, even though it's an American company. It should follow European law when it's interacting with European citizens in a way which fundamentally impacts their fundamental human rights. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that in Europe, when we didn't have this fundamental right, it was very disadvantageous for the power relationship between yeah. citizens, their governments, and the, the kind of fabric of democracy. We see this as a precondition for the exercise of democracy in Europe. A, v a very brief response from you, David, and then I'm going to go back to the questions because I, I see several hands. I think what we need is Europe or Europe's governments to sit down with America and decide on what we call MLATs, Mutual Legal Assessment Treaty, so that if the US government wants to get access to information which concerns Europe, they go through the proper channels and request it, and vice versa. That, I think, is the way forward. Hmm. So I think everyone's outraged, uh, outraged by, the, by the NSA revelations, and I think most people in the room agree that it shouldn't have happened this way, and this is not, um, um, well, it's neither moral nor possibly legal in, in, in some cases. But if we lift the debate, I think um, most people agree that states need to do some sort of surveillance, right? So I would like to have your thoughts on what is, what is uh, reasonable surveillance. Um, so, um, Carl Bildt, the Foreign Ministry of Sweden, um, gave a speech at the Seoul Conference of Cyberspace earlier this year in October, and he put forward seven principles of surveillance. So, he basically said all states need to do surveillance, um, but that doesn't mean you need to breach human rights. So, if you follow these principles uh, that need to be based on law, legitimate aim, necessity, adequacy, proportionality, judicial authority, transparency, and public oversight, then that's how you find that right balance. And I'd like to, to hear your reflections on, on that. Thank you. Robin? Well, I, I think one of the things we're all learning is the deep irony in the word intelligence. What is going on with this collection of data? It's not, it's not being done intelligently. I don't do anything that has a national security dimension. So where's the intelligence in selecting my data to look at. And this isn't, this isn't the nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument. This is that it should be possible to determine whether someone is of interest or not. And if they are not of interest, 
to put them to one side. Thank you. Why isn't that happening? It needs intelligence, and that word has been misapplied. Yeah. Thank you. We've got another question here. I'm going to take one more question now, and then I want to focus on the future with our panel uh, in the last 15 minutes. So, yeah, Vasilis here, Concerned Citizen. Um, I have a question that you already touched uh, a little. What stops the, the US government or other governments uh, to surveillance everything, even though there's legislation? What makes, uh, what will compel them to follow the law? What will compel us to follow the law? Government. Government. It's government. Right. I, I mean this I is the word I'm hearing a lot, which is unusual for internet governance discussions. So I, I, guess, I, I guess the problem is that um, as, as long as you have actors like Google not following data protection law, you're going to have these places that the NSA can tap. So the business model of this industry, which is made after 2001, ironically, um, is such that it's just exceptionally susceptible to national security demands. And so what do we do about Google doesn't want to be regulated, but who wants to be regulated, actually? Who wants to take responsibility for stuff? It's very difficult. Keeps me awake every night. Google? I, I have to say something. We do follow the law. And we don't mind being regulated. We may have opinion about the regulation in itself, but we don't mind being regulated and we do follow the law. Just to sort of mm. balance a bit what, what, what you're saying here. Yeah, thank you. Can I just have your thoughts about the future? You know, we, it's obvious that we, we're all concerned about this. And, you know, the, the consistent message from the room and from the panel is that some of the checks and balances that ought to have restrained this sort of mass surveillance allegedly mass surveillance, it haven't really functioned and that we're not particularly confident in the level of parliamentary oversight or oversight. So what should we do? I mean, is, is the answer technology? Is it encryption? Is it, does it, is it technology? Is it law? Is it users doing something different? What is it? What's your one recommendation? All of the above. All of the above. No, that's, that's cheating. I know. <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think I could boil it down to one. But from, from today's discussion, I've picked out maybe three. Mm. Um, I don't think it is sustainable or ethical to have a secret court using legal powers based on laws that are not published. I don't think that's acceptable <laughs> in any democracy. Um, and that needs to stop. Um, we've talked about proportionality. We've talked a little bit about bad actors. How do you allow the participation of intelligence services who have legitimate aims, but prevent them from becoming bad actors in the system? And the Internet Society, as you saw on the door on the way in, believes that the Internet is for everyone. All the stakeholders in that ecosystem have rights and have legitimate expectations. And we still think that an open multi-stakeholder approach to running the Internet is the best way not of preventing bad actors, but of making their success more difficult and making bad actions easier to detect. So I think we, you know, we, we need to be more vigilant about the way in which that open uh, multi-stakeholder approach is conducted. But I don't think any of the alternatives offer a better future. And in particular, um, we can see the future going in a couple of different paths. And you've probably already seen nation states saying they want to have the fortress that Amelia referred to. Mm. They want to, f to fence off their bit of the internet. I think that would be a mistake. Mm. Um, but but I think Robin, sorry to interrupt you, but Nelly Cruz has actually said these revelations highlight the failure of the multi-stakeholder governance system. And in, th in this room, and in responses to the European Parliament, um, Google, amongst others, was, was advocating laws that are globally applicable. Now, that's not going to be delivered by a multi-stakeholder governance but structure, is it? Is it delivered by anything else. So only Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of all government, apart from all the other types. Um, <laughs> and I think that's true of the multi-stakeholder approach. Try and come up with an alternative that actually makes bad actors' um, uh, success less mm. likely. Okay. And so just very, very briefly, um, I don't think the answer is to retreat behind technical walls and insist on geographic location of data. I think the answer is to insist on um, a clear jurisdictional location for data. 
that's not necessarily a physical location, but it must be clear to us where our data is jurisdictionally, okay. not geographically, but which law applies to it and how we go about enforcing that law and getting redress if something is done to it. Thank you. David Murtanda, Google. I think, I think if, if, if we are going to reap the benefits of having the internet, the internet needs to be open. Uh, and in order for that to, to protect the open internet, we need cooperation and we also need, need a, a, some sort of common understanding on a global level. But in order for that to happen, going back to, to your question earlier on what kind of surveillance is, is, is proportionate, we need transparency. In order to begin in our home ground to have a discussion with Carl Bildt and the others, and the FRA for that sake, on what kind of surveillance can we accept in a democratic society? We need transparency, and that's why the work of forests and alike are so important in trying to shed some light on what is really the, the extent of the problem. Now, I'm, I'm not by any means saying that we as a company don't have a stake in this, because we definitely do a stake and a big responsibility. But above all, I think we need to start off with the government surveillance. Thank you very much. Amelia Andersdorter, so we've heard that the answer is multi-stakeholderism and transparency. Do you feel comforted? Well, um, so we want the internet to be open. This is fine. What do we mean by open? Google is currently applying in their browser a model whereby you can use your browser to contact their cloud to get the permission to use your own graphics card. Is that open? We were involved in these discussions with Google and with the World Wide Web Consortium earlier this spring because actually Google is actively working on closing some of the internet down. Uh, so um, what, what is an open internet? What do we want the internet to be and what is it for? We're not having this discussion. Where's the um, impetus? What was, what was great about the internet to begin with actually? Anyone could produce and contribute whatever they wanted and have other people comment or contribute alike. And that was seen as the, the kind of big advantage of the internet over, say, cable TV or other more um, archaic technologies. Um, so I, I think that discussion about the open, in what do we mean by the open internet? We're not having that. We're saying it. It sounds good, open. But surveillance can also be open, right? It's no contradiction in terms. Open surveillance, why not? Let's have that. That sounds good. Okay. The multi-stakeholder model is this kind of same it's kind of the same thing, that who is the multi in this? How many people do you need before it's multi? Probably more than two, but because then it's by. But when you have three or more, it's multi. So who's to say that a representative from Google, Facebook, and Yahoo meet in the room and take a decision? Is that a multi-stakeholder decision? If not, why not? And so the problem with these technical standard organizations like the World Wide Web Consortium, when we were following the uh, digital rights management discussions, that seems to be Netflix and Google and Microsoft. Is that multi-stakeholder? Mm. So I have this um, a bit of an issue with removing completely the kind of ethical and democratic impetus and legitimacy that um, stems still from the, from the lawmakers. I think that there's a lot of discussions about how we make decisions in this place that we're not having. And there's a lot of accountability that is not being addressed. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have um, with secret courts and, and like in this field now is that we have a, a $1 billion per annum industrial complex that gives services to the national security agencies and the police forces that are doing their own effective lobbying. Only in my two years in Brussels, I've noticed them doing more lobbying on the European Parliament, which I assume means that they've already consolidated their positions in the European Commission. And so that's very worrisome because then we're losing a potentially very strong ally in the European Commission for the fight for human rights. But I have, diff I have severe difficulty seeing how, other than by taking this discussion with the legislators, with the decision-making institutions that make law, such as I do, actually for 500 million people, which is a quite heavy burden to bear, um, we, we, can't solve, we, we can't solve these issues if we don't take that discussion with people like me. It, it, that needs to be done. You can't, you, there's no other way. So but legislators have a role and, and have, a, have a key accountability that perhaps we're not seeing in, in other areas of the system. Yeah, I like want to just go to the audience for a, I, a final round of questions. So put your hands up and then please, yeah. anybody? No? Go for it. So, I mean, the problem is also that legislators are structurally denying their role in the system. I see this so frequently in the European Parliament that we're walking around saying we mustn't over-regulate stuff. But we don't want to, of course we don't want to over-regulate. We want to regulate the right amount. 
it's not like we don't want any regulation at all. So law enforcement, I had this brilliant conversation with a Christian Democratic colleague of mine from the European Parliament whose work I greatly respect, and she says, law enforcement is telling me that they need to do the same thing on the internet that criminals do, because otherwise they lag behind in technology development. But what is it that criminals do that we don't want law enforcement to do? Well, they violate the law. <laughs> And so how can, how can this even be a legitimate argument on the internet? And I think this yeah. idea of that, that actually Google somehow sadly presents that, that you're being very antagonistic towards ideas of regulating Google in specific ways. The fact that the internet technology people often and aggressively resist ideas of, of regulation inside of a legislative model means that you're removing from the legislators the, the impetus to think about what they're doing also with agencies like law enforcement and security agencies, that we just don't understand the impact we're having because the only thing we're hearing is don't regulate, don't, don't regulate, the internet is open, it's free, don't regulate. And so then we end up not regulating the police. Mm. I've got a question down yeah. here. Uh, my name is Daniel Westman, I'm a <coughs> researcher at uh, Stockholm University and also a member of the board of uh, ISOC SE. Uh, I was thinking about the appropriate level for regulating this, and we have talked a lot about the European Union and, and so on, but don't you think that th these most states of the European Union won't, won't accept uh, that the European Union regulate these kinds of issues when we're talking about uh, the fundamental laws of, of security and, and, and uh, and, and surveillance regulation. The probably most governments would say that this is outside the scope of the EU to, to regulate this and also have good arguments for that, what, what's, what's under the EU cooperation. So don't we need to address the politicians in every local parliament uh, really and, and have, uh, have the laws uh, in every country uh, amended or have laws in the first place? We in Sweden, uh, one of the few countries that have a had an open discussion and, and a law on, on these issues. We, we, you can discuss how, how, how good it is, but, but there was a process, at least a, a legislative process. In many countries, mm -hmm. there has, had been no, no process at all. But is it realistic to think that you, you can do th anything about this on the EU level? Don't we need, don't we need to have is regulation in every country? Yeah. So is national law the answer? David, how...? Uh. I don't think this is a Google problem, so by regulating Google you will not solve this. This is a bigger problem, which involves, as Daniel implies, the governments. And I think that we will not reach a situation where all governments will look alike on these issues. And that is why we need to put an effort into finding these bilateral agreements between the different countries in which that if a Norwegian police wants to investigate something which is happening in Sweden, they will turn to the Swedish police and the Swedish police will get access to that information required and send it over to Norway. That kind of respect for each other which comes with those kind of MLAT agreements, I think that is the first step. And if you do it that way, you, there will also be a, a, a certain level of respect for the national view on a lot of topics. It won't necessarily need, require a, a big international law. So I think that is the first step, the sort of MLAT discussion. Yeah. Can I just ask the audience a couple of questions? Um, Vince Cerf, who's um, many of you will be familiar with Google Evangelist, one of the founding fathers of the internet, has said that privacy is now an anomaly or will become an anomaly. Do you agree? Hands up if you agree. Do you think that privacy online is just something that we all have to forget about? We do, do we agree with Vint? So we heard from you at the beginning that you thought that these allegations had Credibility. So, how many of you have changed providers or changed? I have a, a clarifying question there. Yeah. Um, I, I I think you asked two questions: whether okay. it is an anomaly now, and whether we. I want should to know better. That in the, in I should know better than to ask a, a technical audience two no, questions no, 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 in no, one. No, no, <laughs> Crash. No, 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 does good look like mm. and where do we think it will go? They're better questions, always better questions. And, so and, and to me, I, you know, I, I think we're at a turning point where um, 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 the way that good looks like, in, at least in my opinion, is somewhere over there, but the train is heading over there. Mm. And how do we reroute the train? 
guys. I mean, so I, I, on the question of EU uh, versus member state, so we need laws in the member states and in the European Union, and I don't think that one of them precludes the other. These systems have been successfully coexisting since the 1950s, but the origins of the European Union, with the Coal and Steel Union of 1952, which is way, way back, I guess was that through regulating trade between the member states, we could make them live together in peace, understanding and harmony, rather than shooting each other at mm -hmm. mass, as they'd been doing for the 2000 years leading up to that point. And so I think, can we have an e-peace agenda for the internet, which is based on the same principle, through the European Union and regulating trade, I think that's an adequate and relevant goal, actually, and that one shouldn't underestimate that. I, I want to ask, get more questions, and I know that everybody on the panel wants to make at least two more interventions, but we have now run out of time, I'm afraid. Um, I would really like to thank our panellists who have been very game and uh, willing to answer questions uh, and also to thank you in the audience. I think that when the dust has settled, it's interesting to reflect on whether privacy will be an anomaly or whether, as a result of this crisis, we will also seize the opportunity bit of the crisis and perhaps strengthen some of, perhaps strengthen our awareness. Um, just as a final thing, because I like people to, to, to raise their hands, uh, uh, people talk about chilling effects, uh, which we haven't really covered, but. How many people have thought twice about expressing an opinion in a social network or online since these revelations have uh, come? Since or before? And before, well, this is a very, uh, this I is, yeah. you thought this was happening. Yeah. Yeah. The internet has drastically lowered the cost of spy, mass spying, yes. right? Yes. So we need to introduce cost into spying again, because before, nation states have always been spying, right? And they will continue doing that. Didn't Nelly Cruz call it the world's second oldest profession? Probably, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. So, so th th if there was any question here is, how do we introduce cost of spying? Thank you for that question, and I'm sorry that we've run out of time to answer that very pertinent question. I'd like to hand over to the ne next panel um, and, and to Nirani uh, Nimpono, and also perhaps we can thank our panel. <laughs>